Hi, this is Taronish Pithawala, Technical Lead for Geophysical Modeling at Geosoft. This episode is three of a five-part series on inversion best practices. In this video, you'll learn about how constraints can impact your inversion in Voxy. If you're wondering what happened to the episode on understanding magnetization vector inversion results, don't worry, you didn't miss it. We changed the order of the videos, so keep an eye out for it later in the web series. In case you missed the introductory video for this web series, I'll quickly recap the non-unique nature of the inverse problem. The inverse problem starts with an observation in the data space, which can be caused by infinitely many models. One such example is the observed gravity gradient data here that could have been a response to either of these two models. The solution to the inverse problem, then, is non-unique. Constraints can help to rule out certain models. For example, we could constrain the inversion to yield only distinct compact bodies and end up with model 2. Or we could constrain the inversion to find only smooth, deep basement structure and end up with model 1. We choose the constraints based on what we think we know about the geology in the area. And whatever interpretation we make must take these assumptions into consideration. This video will focus on how other data, like that collected from drill holes and geological constructs like basic structure, can be used as constraints to limit the inversion to more plausible results. We'll start with the simplest type of constraint, and one that can be applied to a wide variety of situations. Upper and lower bounds are firm constraints on the rock property within a specified region. The constraint can be used to create overburden layers from grids, or used to limit rock properties within a volume defined by a wireframe. You can also enforce limits on density or susceptibility throughout the entire model. For example, my target of interest may lay beneath a low density or magnetically transparent overburden layer. The contact is defined by this grid here. An unconstrained inversion may place the target within the region occupied by the overburden, yielding a geologically unreasonable model. Using an upper bound constraint to limit the density or the magnetization within the overburden layer to near zero forces the inversion to place the target below the layer. Alternatively, I could apply a set of bounds to an entire model volume. For example, I could enforce positivity in my conventional susceptibility model by applying a lower bound of zero to the entire volume. If I am using iterative reweighting inversion focusing, I may place an upper bound on my entire volume that is based on the largest rock property value I'd expect within it. This will prevent any unreasonable values in my inversion result and may help to refine the structure as well, which is seen in this example. Here, an unconstrained susceptibility result gives a smooth distribution of both positive and negative susceptibilities. By placing a lower bound of 0, which enforces positivity, and an upper bound of 2.2, which is what I expect as the maximum susceptibility for this region, I get a more well-defined result. While upper and lower bounds place firm limits on rock properties within a volume, Parameter reference models are more flexible constraints that can be used to guide the inversion toward a particular result. In the introductory video, you learned about the model norm. I'll reiterate it here. Since there are an infinity of models that satisfy the observed data, we can narrow down our choices by finding one that is close to a preferred reference model. This closeness is quantified by the model norm, given by this expression here. You will recall that we seek to minimize the model norm, and so we want the predicted model to be very close to the reference model. The reference model is always specified, and is by default full of zeros. When you change the default from the null model, you should incorporate some a priori knowledge about the volume of interest. It is important to note that the rock property values you enter into the reference model must be consistent with the background you've removed in your modeling. For example, a parameter reference model for a gravity inversion should contain densities that are relative to the background density removed during the complete Bouguer correction. The parameter reference model can be represented as a wireframe reference model, as a drill hole reference model, or a simple geometric one. The parameter reference model is used by the inversion in conjunction with the parameter weighting model. 
The weighting model specifies how confident you are in your reference model and will affect the flexibility of the inversion to converge on a solution that is close to your reference. This equation shows that when the weighting is large, the predicted model must be very similar to the reference model since we want to minimize the model norm. When the weighting is small, the predicted model has the option to deviate from the reference model. By default, the confidence in the null model is very low. For example, I may suspect that my target body is tabular in shape with some dip and azimuth at some depth in my volume. I may also have an estimate of the density or susceptibility expected for this particular rock type, relative to the background, of course. In this simple example, I have a parameter reference model comprised of a dipping slab with a susceptibility of 0.03 SI. The information used to create this model was extrapolated from a few shallow drill holes. As such, I'm only confident in the upper portion of this reference model. I can define a parameter weighting model so that the shallow parts of my model are forced to fit more closely to my reference model, whereas the deeper parts are able to vary more freely. I do this by creating a voxel with a value of 1 in the upper cells and a value of 0 0.001 in the deeper cells. On the left, we have an unconstrained inversion with the tabular body shown in the gray wireframe. Note that the inversion result is smooth and spherical and is not indicative of the true structure of the tabular source. On the right, we have applied a parameter reference constraint with the susceptibility and distribution we predict for the tabular source, plus the weighting constraint that we created. The effect of the constraints are clear. Where we were confident in the reference model, the inversion honored the tabular source. At depth, where we had less confidence, the inversion was unencumbered by the reference model. Note that even where we had little confidence in the model, the result is still better than the unconstrained inversion. That is because changes in one model cell will affect the other cells in the volume. There is another type of reference model that is useful when you don't have a sense of the actual rock property values, only their relative distribution. The gradient reference model can be used if, for example, you suspect a sharp contrast in density or susceptibility across a geological contact. There is always a gradient reference model specified and the default model is perfectly smooth in x, y, and z directions. Creating your own gradient reference model is a lot like creating a parameter reference model. You can use your wireframes, drill hole data, or simple geometries, but instead of entering exact parameter values, enter them relative to one another. Voxy will compute the gradients in x, y, and z for you. The gradient reference model operates in conjunction with weighting models one for east and west weighting, one for north-south weighting, and finally, one for gradient weighting with depth. And like the parameter weighting constraint, the gradient weighting constraint defines your confidence in the gradient reference model. Two simple examples of how to apply the gradient reference and weighting voxels follow. First, we revisit the overburden example. On the left, we see that a lower bound was used to simulate a magnetically transparent top layer. The target body is distributed smoothly below this boundary. If the contact between the top and lower layers is unconformable, we may expect that the target body abuts the contact sharply. Using a combination of a smooth gradient reference model and a low vertical gradient weighting at the boundary between the two layers, we can enforce a sharp susceptibility contrast at the unconformity, but allow for smooth distribution within the layers. Next, we look at a synthetic example of an intrusive body. The true body is shown in the gray mesh. It is a well-defined elongate intrusive corresponding to a positive magnetic anomaly. The default model incorporates a smooth gradient reference model and equal gradient weighting in all directions. The result is a smooth distribution of susceptibility that makes it difficult to interpret the intrusive's lateral extents. Keeping the default smooth gradient reference model, we make changes to our confidence in it by adjusting the gradient weights in the lateral and vertical directions. Since we expect the intrusive to have a well-defined contact, 
we lower our confidence weighting in the east-west and north-south directions for the smooth reference. Since we expect the intrusive to be vertically homogeneous, we increase our confidence weighting in the smooth reference model in the vertical direction. The result is a distribution of susceptibility that has well-defined horizontal boundaries and extends vertically to depth. In this final example, we'll combine the methods I've outlined to show you the impact well-defined constraints can have on your inversion. We'll look at an iron formation in southwestern Australia. The airborne magnetic data is shown here, along with the default unconstrained susceptibility inversion. The overall trend of the iron formation has been recovered, but little about the dip or lateral extent can be deduced from the default smooth model. We can apply some basic constraints, such as upper and lower bounds, plus the iterative reweighting method to sharpen the target. We do not expect any negative susceptibilities in this particular case, nor do we expect, from previous studies, to find susceptibilities relative to the background larger than 1 SI. The effect of applying these bounds is obvious. The target definition is much clearer, and we can deduce some dip as well. This particular region of interest has been explored with diamond drill holes, and a wireframe model of the mineralized lithology was created by the geologist. It looks like the inversion result has placed a susceptible zone between the upper and lower iron formations. Is this real or simply an artifact since we're missing high susceptibilities within the lower formation? To test this theory, we can create a parameter reference and gradient weighting model using the wireframe and some expectation of susceptibility values from previous studies. We are confident in our reference model within the volume defined by the drilling, but not outside it, so we create an appropriate parameter weighting model. In addition, we expect the contact to be sharply defined, so we use gradient weighting to define low confidence in the smooth model at the contacts of the wireframe. The result here is shown in pink. By using the parameter reference model, we were able to force the inversion to place susceptibility in the lower iron formation, but let it vary freely outside of the wireframe. We still see a connection between the two wireframes and can thus say that it is not an artifact due to the absence of susceptibility in the lower formation. In this case, by using constraints, the inversion was able to tell us something that we weren't able to see from the drilling. It should be noted that all the inversion outcomes in this example fit the observed magnetic data equally well. However, each fit with the assumed geology a little differently. Choosing the right model requires a mutual consistency between the model and all known observations. We saw how constraints can be used to add insight from other sources into the inversion process. The impact is profound. A well-defined constraint can dramatically alter the inversion result. When interpreting the result, it is equally important to consider the assumptions that went into creating the constraints. This presentation has focused on three of the most impactful constraint types, but there are a number of other constraints in Voxy you can use. To recap, the starting model is used to give the inversion algorithm a place to start. If it is well chosen, it can improve the speed of the inversion. The parameter reference model helps guide the inversion toward the expectant distribution. The gradient reference model helps guide the inversion towards a gradient distribution that you expect. Upper and lower bounds help define limits on the rock property being modeled. Parameter and gradient weighting models specify how confident you are in the reference models. The active model constraint allows you to choose what parts of the starting model you'd like to hold fixed. An iterative reweighting inversion focusing focuses the positive and or negative ends of the property distribution to create a more compact model. Reweighting constraints can be used to influence the depth of the property distribution or to focus the gravity result using the magnetic model. Our next episode will present the vector components of magnetization vector inversion results using a synthetic example, so stay tuned for that. For more information on constraints in Voxy, visit the Voxy Learning Center at geosoft.com.